So let's say you don't value your sanity at all and you want to do research in modern physics. Well, what areas are there to actually do research in? There's essentially three, although there's a couple of extra redheaded stepchildren. And those three major areas are astrophysics, which is looking up at the stars, and there's particle physics slash high energy physics, which is slamming together elementary particles at phenomenally high energies, looking for the basic building blocks of the universe. And then there's condensed matter physics, which is looking at lumps of stuff. And that's the field that I chose to go into. And I actually think it's kind of the most enjoyable as well as the most active of the three at the moment. Although I should mention there's a couple of other areas and as well as some other add-ons, which are, there's also plasma physics, which has a lot of overlap with mechanical engineering, especially fluid dynamics, and of course has major applications to fusion research, although fusion and plasma physics are not the same thing. They overlap uh, quite a lot. Um, fusion is a nuclear engineering problem, not a physics problem, but they need to understand plasma dynamics very, very well. And so pl plasma physicists that do basic plasma physics research often get involved in that. And then there's what they call atomic, molecular, and optical physics, which is sort of a similar area to condensed matter physics, but they look at clouds of atoms and molecules and how they interact with light. Uh, whereas condensed matter physics, we look at, well, condensed matter. And what does that mean? It basically means anything that's not some super high energy state or plasma or anything like that. It means solids and liquids for the most part. And why do we study those things? Well, because in condensed matter physics, we're interested in complexity, right? We're interested not in finding the basic building blocks of the universe the way they are in particle physics, and we're not necessarily interested in where, you know, the various structures that we see today came from the way they might be in astrophysics. Uh, and we're instead interested in, if you take these things that we vaguely know about, you know, like electrons and protons and neutrons that, you know, we have a pretty good understanding of the basic existence of uh, how what happens if instead of just taking like you know two of those at a time and slamming them together and letting them interact the way you do in a particle accelerator for high energy physics what happens if you take millions and billions and trillions of them and throw them all in a you know solid or a liquid together and then let them interact in some complicated way and that lets us study some pretty interesting phenomenon probably the most famous that you might have heard of is superconductors. And a superconductor, just like the name sounds, is a uh, material that conducts electricity with no electrical resistance. So if you know Ohm's law, you can apply zero voltage to a superconductor and still get a current. Uh, or if you were to apply voltage, you would theoretically get an infinite current, but of course it doesn't quite work that way. What happens is currents will start flowing and there won't be any voltage as a result. And so it just takes a very, very, a very, very small voltage will induce, you know, so small you can't even measure it really, will induce a very large current in the superconductor. Uh, but there are always limits in the real world. And one of the interesting things about superconductors is that there's never any, like, voltage required to sustain the current through the superconductor. But there is a maximum amount of current that they can conduct before they basically stop being superconductors. And so we're very, very interested in when do things go from being regular conductors to superconductors, or when do they go from being uh, electrical conductors to electrical insulators, and you know when do they go from being uh, you know like a magnetized magnet to an unmagnetized material, and things like that. And the other sort of poster child that we have is nanotechnology, because it's frequently very interesting to engineer uh, structures that can contain electrons in such a way that their quantum mechanical properties are slightly altered so that we can study the way electrons interact under sort of special circumstances. And that's what I actually spent my PhD on. Um, this is, that's what this little, my little lump of stuff here is supposed to represent. This is like a, supposed to represent something called a quantum well. So, uh, you know, basically you can imagine, you know, a sandwich of three different materials here, uh, each of which is just uh, 
you know, a few nanometers thick, like the typical ones we would measure would be 848. Um, and all this would be is you would have one material, say the green material, where electrons tend to be, and where they sort of like to be, and then a red material where electrons don't like to be quite so much. Uh, you know, basically they just have the green material would be a material with a smaller band gap, if you know what that is. And so we could study things in these artificial structures. And the reason that I am so interested in condensed matter physics is, well, on some level, if I'm being honest, it's because I'm a little bit of a control freak. And if you want to work in particle physics or astrophysics, which are really awesome fields, uh, you get to do these really cool things, like especially astrophysics, I still think is pretty interesting, and I almost did do astrophysics before choosing condensed matter. But particle physics especially has this problem where if you want to be an experimentalist, you need to work on these huge, huge projects that take years and years to complete, and you only get to be a, a tiny part of them, which I actually don't mind being a tiny part of a very large collaboration, but I do mind it when it takes years and years and years and you kind of just get lost in this huge sea of stuff and I don't know, I enjoy being able to actually do experiments that fit on a lab bench where, you know, I'm definitely not doing it completely alone. I, you know, have peers that I would help and that would help me. And also we had collaborators that would help make the structures. And we also had a theoretical physicists, because I'm an experimentalist, and we would collaborate with the, with the theorists and they would run simulations to help uh, see if what we thought we were seeing in our experiments was actually what we were seeing and different things like that. But at the end of the day, it was like, take some sample of some quantum well structure, you know, put it on a lab bench, shine a laser at it, and look at the uh, look at the light that came out, <laughs> you know. Which incidentally, that's basically, you know, if you want a summary of my PhD, it was basically take a laser like this. Oh, that's the red one. Uh, take a laser like this blue laser, which if you shine in my hand is blue, and then take something like this tennis ball that if you shine at it, see now it's green. See, blue, green, blue, green. <laughs> Uh, even though the the light coming out of here is blue, and that's because which oh if, if which incidentally though if you want to see uh, notice if I take the the red laser and I shine it at the tennis ball it's still red 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 versus with the blue one blue green um, and the reason for that is that uh, tennis balls will say fluoresce right if you put this under a black light it'll also put out green light and. That's a very common technique in condensed matter physics, and it's very useful in electrical engineering and material science, where you just shine a laser at something and a different wavelength of light comes out than the one that you shined in. And that has to do with the, the type of quantum well structure that I was studying and the way that we would do it. So we would actually use what's called the double quantum well structure. So you can imagine that uh, yet another one of, take this entire thing, repeat it all over again, uh, and stack it, um, and you know, the, the thing that was key to my PhD, so you can imagine uh, with this, this is like, you know, actual atoms uh, just bonded to each other. But, you know, each one of these layers is still like tens to hundreds of atoms thick. Um, so, you know, still, still very small, right? These are like only like, you know, a few nanometers, like I said, 848. Um, but they're still, you know, I guess you'd call them big compared to what I got my PhD in. In, uh, which is taking a structure like this with several atoms where there's actually like, you know, uh, the same covalent bonds hold, that, hold the, that hold it together um, in this axis are also holding it together in this axis uh, between the quantum wells versus my PhD was taking something that was only one atom thick like this uh, piece of cardboard here uh, or uh, I guess construction paper, poster board uh, taking it and taking another paper thin layer and just sandwiching those together and holding them together with something called Van der Waals forces, which is a bit more like this uh, double-sided tape here. So take that, then take another one, and bam. Got one material sandwiched between two materials, you got yourself a quantum well. Um, but now it's made out of things that are just one atom thick. Uh, the most And so the most famous material like this is graphene, right? Uh, but we were using, we actually used graphene uh, as, a, as an electrode to just attach to the top, right? Because we need something electrically conductive uh, to put on top to be able to control things. 
Um, and, you know, so the Vander Wall's forces are, are, are weak, right? I can just tear this back apart. Um, and so the it's, you know, they're held together via covalent bonds within the structure, uh, but then the bonds between the layers are uh, what's called Vander Waals forces. And each one of these layers would only be um, either a single atom or what we call a single unit cell thick. So you know, some of them were actually three atoms thick, but one, you know, set of atoms, you know, a molybdenum and two sulfur atoms, particularly in my case. And so, yeah, condensed matter physics is really cool. Um, it's not the only field of physics, but we're kind of the uh, forgotten one amongst the, the big three, right? Um, astrophysics has always gotten a lot of press, and rightfully so, because the stars, it's awesome. Uh, and particle physics has gotten more press over the last few decades, although unfortunately that's been for the worst thing, which is string theory, uh, which is garbage. P like, I... I there's sometimes too much of a hype train of people saying string theory bad, but there was so much of a hype train for string theory that I think it's kind of warranted that we all now spend a little while going, yeah, string theory, it's stupid. <laughs> um, but particle physics as a whole was not stupid, right? Like when they found the Higgs boson, that really was a monumental achievement. Uh, no th those things are really, really cool. Um, but condensed matter physics, we don't really get a whole lot of press. Uh, the Higgs boson actually, was a good, that was something that's good particle physics press. Condensed matter physics, we don't get a lot of press. Right, the we will occasionally you'll occasionally hear people talk about superconductors. You'll occasionally hear people talk about nanotechnology, but you don't hear people talk about solid state physics, condensed matter physics very often, which is unfortunate because it's really cool. And you know we study all sorts of amazing things. Like I'm saying, like you can understand why a magnet goes from being uh, magnetized to demagnetized. And that corresponds to uh, the temperature going up and magnet, the little tiny magnets inside the, the big magnet being randomly aligned to being all aligned uh, when you cross through the transition temperature or vice versa. They start at all aligned uh, at a nice cool temperature and then you start getting them hotter and hotter and then they, they all start flipping randomly and it's no longer a magnet. So uh, I'd like to explore all those things in more detail in the future. Magnets, superconductors, the thing, you know, quantum well structures, all the things that I have some measure of expertise in. Hopefully I'll get around to it. Uh, I'm generally too lazy and depressed to do much of anything these days, but uh, hopefully I'll get around to it. Uh, also planning to do some more detailed explanations of some flying things and finally do a follow-up on the roller rounds and ang angular momentum explanation. Uh, uh, it'll hopefully be better than my previous one, so... Anyways, uh, thanks for watching. Peace.